Hey everyone, Andrew here. So before we start, I'd like to give a huge thank you for those who supported my challenge campaign. People like Isaac Camp, Mr. Anonymous, ProxyCast, Machendo, YoshiKiller2S, Max Ascar, Jordan Osceola, Ren Elise, Patrick Vokolsky, Jeremy Z, and Stevie Roeder, just to name a few. With your help, not only was my computer fixed, but more importantly, you all donated roughly $700 to Rafa House. And to thank you all, I made this video based on the majority of your votes. So please enjoy. <laughs> The Professor Layton series marks a lot of firsts for me. Diabolical Box was the first game I ever beat 100%, Unwound Feature was the first video game that I cried while playing, and Miracle Mass was the first 3DS game I owned. It's crazy to think that this simple puzzle game has shaped my life so much since its first release in 2008 with Curious Village. I remember playing a demo of the game at a local department store, and I just thought to myself, wow, what a beautiful game, and instantly I was hooked. The interesting story, the amazing puzzles, the memorable characters, it all came together to create an incredible game. However, in the early stages of the first title's development, there was no story, and there were no characters. In fact, the game was instead going to be a spiritual successor to the hit game, Brain Age. So on this episode of Beta 64, we're going to learn about the development of Professor Layton and the Curious Village. Curious Village began as a simple idea by Akihiro Hino, who would become president of Level 5, the eventual creators of the Professor Layton series. During his childhood, Hino fell in love with Atama no Taiso, literally, head gymnastics. They were puzzle books, written by Professor Akira Tagu at Chiba University. However, these books were labeled as mental exercises and lacked the casual nature that would become the Professor Layton series. That's why when Hino came up with the idea of a series of puzzle-based games, he wanted them to be a pleasant, casual experience by adding a few game-like elements. Flash forward a few years to the Nintendo DS's release, at this time, Level 5 had already created numerous titles, but instead of simply developing video games, they wanted to publish them as well, and Hino thought the DS would be the perfect fit. The only problem was that there were some people who said that games that weren't made by Nintendo didn't sell well on the system, and Hino wondered why. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that some owners of the DS didn't buy the system because they liked to play games. A big example is Brain Age. That game was extremely popular in Japan when it released. According to Hino and his team's analysis on the game's sales, it turns out that many casual users who owned the DS system were more interested in owning a popular game than looking for a quality game. So to make their first game as a publisher a success, the team knew what they had to do. A successor to Brain Age. With this game, they were hoping to create a great experience for those who had never played another DS game besides Brain Age. During the conceptualization of Curious Village, Hino vetoed almost everything the team came up with at first, and told him that this game was going to be unlike anything they had ever done before. One of the biggest things he wanted to do was to tell players what to do at all times, so they wouldn't get lost. After all, the game was designed for those who had almost no gaming experience, and since this was a handheld title, Hino expected people to take breaks from playing the game, too, and he wanted to make sure that the player always knew where to go next, no matter how long the break was. One of the team members, upon hearing this, said, If we go that far, I don't know if we can call this a game anymore. To which Hino replied, This doesn't have to be a game. The first prototype of Curious Village began being developed in 2006, and was led by Hino and Professor Tago. Despite wanting this series of games to be directly related to the Atama no Taiso books, the studio was not allowed to use the title due to copyright infringement. Even though this was very disappointing, at this point in development, it was too late to turn back. However, because of this setback, a new idea surfaced. A story. The idea was simple. The team would go and create a bonus mode where players would solve puzzles as part of a story. And so, they did. They created the story based around the puzzles that Professor Tago had created for his books. But who would be the protagonist of this puzzling story? Why, a detective, of course. Hino chose to create two intelligent characters who would bounce ideas off of each other. 
and unsurprisingly, he got his inspiration for the characters from Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Hino then decided to have one of the artists on the team draw one character as an English gentleman and the other as a younger character. As temporary names, Hino called them Professor Layton and Luke, and as you likely know, those names stuck. According to Hino himself, the two characters have stayed exactly the same since he first conceived them. With the characters finished, it was time to write an outline of the game's plot, which stayed largely the same from then until release. Hino explained in an interview that when writing a storyline for a latent game, he begins with just a worldview and a game concept, and eventually writes a script around 50 to 100 pages, which are then broken down into the game's dialogue and text. Now it was time for the puzzles, almost all of which were written specifically for Curious Village. These brain teasers were written via a process they called Puzzle Camp. This team of puzzle aficionados was headed by Professor Tago, and they frequently had heated discussions for several days designing puzzles. During this time, finding a balance between normal puzzles and those based on math, geometry, and even tricks was very important. By using descriptive text and illustrations, they tried making the puzzles look and feel interesting, and many of them relied heavily on a flash of inspiration, but that was all by design. The development of Curious Village was rather quick, lasting only around a year. The game was released in Japan February 5th, 2007, in North America February 10th, 2008, and in Europe nine months later. Now, as you may or may not know, many times when games are released in various regions, their box art is changed to better suit the culture they're coming into, like Skyward Sword, Uncharted Golden Abyss, Pat Upon 3, and Rayman Legends, which looks way better in Japan. But anyway, Curious Village's box art had some drastic changes between its release in Japan, Europe, and the US. But these changes weren't made simply because one place thought they could make it better than the other. Instead, there were actually some big cultural reasons behind these changes. First, when deciding how a box art will look, you obviously have to take into account the game's audience. As we've already learned, Curious Village was going to be a very casual game for a very casual audience. And since women were considered the majority of casual DS owners, Level 5 decided to market the game to women. To help generate publicity, the team hired well-known TV personalities as voice actors for the characters. And what goes better with quality voice acting than quality animation? So those cutscenes that were so incredible roughly 8 or more years ago were made to target the female audience. Now, the boxer in Japan was made for the same purpose. The design on the back was modeled after women's magazines by featuring the voice actors with interviews beside their portraits. The whole point of this was to make Curious Village not seem like a game, so even those not interested in gaming would want to pick it up. Now, on to US and Europe. First, the US box art was made to look more or less the same as the one in Japan, except for the back of the box, which instead of focusing on voice actors, focused on story and a bit of the puzzles. The European box art, however, was massively different, so much so that Hino had a problem releasing the game with that cover. Long story short, Nintendo of Europe thought that having the box showcase puzzles rather than story or characters would be more accepted by those in Europe. However, Hino told them that he wanted the package to show story, since after all, this game is a fusion of puzzles and story. But Nintendo of Europe didn't budge, and later Hino realized just how good this box art was for that region. From then on, Hino always was quick to take their advice. Now let's take a look at what went unused in the file system of Curious Village. Ignoring Japanese leftovers and localized versions, which there are a lot of, there's still quite a few early versions of some in-game graphics. Let's start with the title screen. The first version looks pretty close to the final Japanese title screen, except as you can see, there are some differences. First off, Layton's hat logo was changed between the two, as the early version lacks the distinct L on the hat, among other changes. Not only that, the text beside the logo has a white outline, not present in the final. However, the early version is missing lines on the top and bottom of the text. The title text is also very generic in the early version, and is using an unregistered trademark logo instead of the registered counterpart. The last difference is that the copyright is listed as 2006, though the game was released in 2007 in Japan. For the bottom screen, there's a placeholder select screen that is obviously going to look very different from the final game. And while the new game and continue options are here, the bonuses area has yet to be included. There's actually an even earlier title screen in the game's files too, much, much earlier. Remember when Curious Village was going to be directly related to the Atama no Taiso books? Well, it turns out that they made a title screen for the game during that time, and it's still here. 
The text says Tago Akira no Atama no Taiso EX, which translates to Tago Akira's Mental Gymnastics EX. Needless to say, when the idea fell through because of copyright issues, they had to scrap this version of the title screen. Somewhat related to title screens, there's also a leftover screen for a demo version of the game. These options are from top to bottom, towards the town Layton, scary incident, and look at the animation on the DS. Another early screen that was left over in the game is for the save file selection. The text on the top is the same yet with a slightly different font, but it's also very basic compared to the final version. The reason that this is is explained by the file name, which is testbg.arc, so testbackground.arc. So this screen was likely a very early placeholder image. At the start of the game, remember the chat between Leighton and Luke when they discussed the letter that Leighton received? Well, there's a placeholder for the final watercolored images that are shown. On the bottom of the screen, there's some text that says skip demo, but the most interesting thing is that none of these angles are used in the final version. Now, we've actually made it into the gameplay. There are two interesting graphics that are used during this part. The first is a placeholder checkered background, which is nothing special. The second though is an unused sprite that was a placeholder for NPC dialogue sections. It's a strange dragon-like thing that was likely drawn just for fun, as it wouldn't fit anywhere in the game. The trunk also has a couple of graphics that show off its early design. It's got a place for hint coins, time spent playing, puzzles found, puzzles solved, items collected, an item list, a button to save, read the investigation memo, and play past puzzles in the puzzle index. One thing that caught my eye is that while the early design uses kanji for a lot of the text, the final Japanese version doesn't use any kanji in the trunk menu, likely to make it easier to read for those inexperienced with kanji. Now, one thing that's very interesting is that this early trunk is missing the mysteries menu where you can get more details about the current mysteries you've discovered. They must have added this in later. Another thing that's missing is the current location of Layton, but this early version does have one additional counter right here that literally translates to items that were put into hand. But a better translation would be items you've previously gotten. So this counter would have counted how many items you'd collected on your journey. Now we've made it to the section of unused images that were once part of the biggest part of the Layton series, the puzzles. First, here's an early image of the puzzle intro where it tells you the puzzle title and associated number. It's very basic and was probably a placeholder. There's also a few unused buttons too, one for hints, one for next word, and one for previous word. The last three early unused images were made for specific puzzles, and we're going to start with an early description for puzzle number nine, One Poor Pooch. I managed to talk with someone from Japan who was nice enough to translate this text for us. It says, answer what happened to this dog after that, since it was hit by a car, dot, dot, dot. This is close to what's written at the beginning part of the final text, but it's still different as it doesn't mention that the dog is made of matches. Plus is missing the tutorial section of the description, since this is the first match puzzle for the player to solve. Also, just for clarity's sake, the button on the top right is the hint button, and the one on the bottom left is the return button which is a bit weird since the description only appears on the top screen in the final game. And the top screen is not a touch screen, so how are you supposed to press these buttons? So it may have been on the bottom screen at first, but the puzzle part also has to be on the bottom screen as well, because you have to move the matches. So I guess there was originally a button you could use to bring up the description on the bottom screen, kind of like Layton's 3DS outings. But this is all speculation. The next image is for scales puzzles, like puzzle 6, lightweight, where you have to place the one lighter weight onto the section on the bottom right. And that separated rectangle part on the bottom has the submit button. This image was obviously a placeholder and not meant to be in the final game. The last puzzle related image is an early input screen called virusbg.arc, so it's likely that this was for bottle full of germs, otherwise known as puzzle 26. It looks quite different from the final version. Starting from the top, there are a couple additional kanji next to your inputted answer. The left one means answer, and the right one means minutes, which makes sense with this puzzle, because you have to input how long in minutes it will take to fill an entire jar with germs. Another difference is that this early version only has two slots to draw numbers on, so you could originally write only up to 99 minutes instead of the 999 like in the final. It's also missing the hint button, the back button, and the solve later button. So that's the development of Professor Layton and the Curious Village. I have to say, I'm glad the development team didn't make this game specifically associated with Tago's mental gymnastics. This development story is a classic example of how when one door closes, another one opens. 
Even though copyright issues caused Hino to have to rethink the entire game, because he did, he created Professor Layton, a series that has been an incredible success and has completely redefined the puzzle genre. And not only that, the beautiful story featured in these games has touched many lives around the world, myself included. So thank you, Hino, for such an incredible series. So this has been Beta64 with Professor Layton and the Curious Village. Thanks for watching. <laughs> well, one must always put a lady's needs first. That's what a gentleman does. Thank you.